even thinking about what our dream is can be paralyzing for us. Because we feel like in order to have a dream or to share a dream, we have to see the whole dream in its fullest sense. Everyone has a sense that we're here for a reason. You, you may not be able to put a bunch of flesh on it. You may just have the seed of it. And part of this series is designed to encourage you to think and even begin talking about that. Even in its seed form, holding with an open hand, knowing that just like with an acorn, sometimes there's a planting and a releasing and a burying and a breaking and a transforming along the way as it becomes what was there all along. to see you guys. Glad you're here today. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab it. Meet me in Genesis 37 today. Genesis 37. So excited that you are here for week one of a, a series that we're going to be in for the next several weeks together through the story of Joseph. We've called In Your Dreams. And maybe to start the series, that's the question I have for you. What's in your dreams? You know, we're going to discover over the next several weeks together, going all the way back to the very beginning of the story of God, God's people have always been dreamers. And when I say dreams, I don't just mean what happens to you when you're laying on your bed, you know, asleep in the middle of the night, that too. But I have a broader sense in mind. When we talk about dreams, we're talking about this vision or a sense, what God wants to do with you or perhaps for you, or through you. A reason, maybe even the reason, that he put you on the planet. I wonder if you have a sense of what that is. Maybe for you, it's this crystal clear calling about who you're made to be in the world. Or maybe it's more of a fuzzy sense that you can't really name, but you can't really shake. The kind of person that you want to be, the kind of person you want to become, maybe the kind of difference that you want to make through your family or your career in the world. My guess is if we were to sit down with every single one of us and convince you that it was totally safe, that all of us have some kind of sense of a dream, a dream that we're living with and maybe have been living with for a really, really long time. Even if we don't see it clearly or even if we're not totally sure that the seeds of the dream that we have are from God at all. Maybe they seem shallow or even self-centered, superficial. That's part of the point of the series. It's most of the point for today to discover what it looks like to live in your dreams. I was thinking this week about some of the stories that we live and the stories that we love. And I wonder if you've got a favorite story, maybe a favorite book, favorite movie. So I was thinking about it just for myself, trying to answer the question this week. I realized that most of my favorite stories are all comeback stories. They're all underdog stories. Start with somebody that's young, that has a dream and chases the dream and loses the dream before finding the dream catches up with them by the end of the story. It's the Rockies and the Rudies and frankly the fairy tales and even some of the Disney movies that I grew up loving as a child. 
All the best stories are comeback stories. And I wonder if there's not a reason for that. I wonder if that doesn't tap into something within us that's built in to all of us. I mean, we love great stories because we want to live great stories, don't we? Well, I mean, we say we want to live great stories. We think we want to live great stories. I don't think we really want to live great stories. At least I don't want to live a great story. I want to live in the ending of a particular kind of story for a really long time. That's what I want to live, if I'm being honest. Like, I want to live my whole life in the happily ever after. I don't want any part of the poisoned apples or the wicked stepmothers or the fathers that are nowhere to be found. I want to conquer the Russian like Rocky. I don't want the years of training. I don't want the heartbreak. I don't want the nagging sense that I'm nothing more than just another bum from the streets. When it comes to the story of Joseph, I want the end of the dream. I want none of the in-between. Are you familiar with the story of Joseph? We love the story of Joseph. It's a great story because it's a story that's, that's filled with conflict and betrayal and treachery, murderous intent, and rescue from certain death just in the nick of time. It's a story of sexual tension, reversals of fortune, and family drama, delayed gratification, and plot twists all along the way that all take place between a kid who has a dream and the moment the dream is realized. It turns out living the dream is a lot different from just dreaming the dream. Dreams aren't just about having a dream and catching it. It's about how to live in your dreams along the way. Joseph shows us how to live with dreams. How to live in your dreams and with your dreams, even when you're nowhere near living the dream. Which is good news, because that describes most of us today. We all have some sense of how God's created us, why he's created us. Our question is, how do we live in the meantime? What do we do in the meantime? When it's not coming to pass, when it feels like we're waiting forever, when it feels like the dream will never come true and maybe even can't ever come true from here. Ultimately, what we're going to discover in this series is this. The best thing about a big dream is not the dream coming to pass. It's who the dream giver makes you in the process. The best thing about a big dream is not the dream coming to pass. It's who the dream giver makes you in the process. We're going to spend six weeks in the story. It's ten chapters long. Today, I just want to give you a bird's eye view of the story and pull on that thread of dreams just a bit as it shows up all the way through Joseph's life. And in the weeks ahead, we're going to go back and dive into each of the individual scenes one by one. So if you're in Genesis chapter 37, that's where Joseph's story begins. And it's actually the continuation of a story that's a family story already in progress. If you've read through Genesis, you realize it starts by tracing a promise that's made to Abraham. And then to his son Isaac and his son Jacob. And now we're to Joseph, Jacob's son. Actually, Jacob's favorite son. Because Genesis 37 tells us Joseph was born to Jacob in his old age. Which is offensive. Because Jacob was about 40 when Joseph was born to him in his old age. Joseph's the favorite son of the favorite wife, 
which becomes important in the story. Jacob doesn't try to hide his favoritism. He gives Joseph a multi-technicolor dream coat you might have heard about. That brings us to the dream. Look at Genesis 37, verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Which maybe sounds like a weird response to a dream. Until you realize the content of the dream. And it's actually two dreams, one theme. One of the dreams, the brothers are all out working in the fields, gathering wheat, when suddenly Joseph's sheaf of wheat stands straight up, and all of the other sheaves of wheat bow down to him. Now think for a second if that was your brother or sister telling you about their dream. You imagine yourself responding to their dream saying, wow, I bet that's from God. We better pay attention to that. If you don't know the beginning of the story and you don't know the ending of the story, you assume this dream is not from God. This is from the imagination of an obnoxious, arrogant, punk, 17-year-old kid that needs to be slapped back to sleep to dream again. And even more when he doubles down on the dream with another dream, same theme. Hey, guys, when I was dreaming last night, we were stars. And mom and dad were the sun and the moon. And you guys bowed down to me. And mom and dad bowed down to me. What do you think it means? You'd hate him too. So skip down to verse 19. Brothers are out working. The favorite son is not out working. Jacob sends the favorite son to check on the working sons, and they see him coming. Verse 19, here comes that dreamer, they say to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him to one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. And that line sets the tension for the rest of Joseph's story. And it sets the tension for yours as well. What will come of his dreams? And what will come of yours? Well, the brothers decide not to kill Joseph because it just so happens at the moment they're ready to take his life, a better opportunity presents itself. They sell him into slavery. And he goes off to Egypt, a long way from home. And just notice this for now. We'll come back to it later. In just the first chapter, God gives Joseph a dream. And then almost immediately, Joseph finds himself living the exact opposite of the dream. I wonder if you can relate to that. If you know how the story goes, Joseph turns out to be really great at being a slave. We'll cover that next week. He rises through the ranks, then he gets falsely accused of something that he hadn't done. He gets thrown into prison where he sits for some time, likely years. When chapter 40 finds himself doing time with two political prisoners of Pharaoh, who both have dreams, to which Joseph says, <laughs> don't we all? But he tells them what the dreams mean. Both of their dreams come to pass in, get this, three days. One of them in a way you don't want your dream to come true, and another in a way you do. But get this, as far as we can tell, neither of those guys are following God. Neither of them are faithful to the dream giver in any way. Their dreams come to pass in three days, while Joseph's dreams feel as far away as they've ever been. Can you relate? To that. And then to make matters worse, the cupbearer walks free out of jail into his dreams and completely forgets about Joseph. Chapter 41, verse 1. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh has a dream. And nobody can figure out what it means. And suddenly the cupbearer remembers something he'd forgotten. They send for Joseph, hoping he's still alive down there. They clean him up and dress him up and stand him up in front of the most powerful man in the world, who says, verse 15, I had a dream. No one can interpret. 
But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I can't do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. You notice all the cockiness is gone. The confidence in God remains over and over and over in the story. And sure enough, God tells Joseph what the dream means. And he tells it to Pharaoh, who proclaims he's the second wisest person in Egypt and by there in the whole world. Look at chapter 42, verse 6. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain. He holds the sheaves of wheat. When Joseph's brothers arrive in Egypt, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And it says, then he remembered his dreams. There's all kinds of family drama we're going to come back to in the series. It's really important. But near the end of the story, chapter 46, verse 6, Joseph says this, For two years now there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And they all lived happily ever after. Ish. Actually not. There's still a lot of struggle after that. There's work to do after that, even once you're living in the dream. We'll get to it as we go, but let's push pause on all of that for today. There's tons that we can learn from Joseph's story. Just tracing the storyline between the dream and its fulfillment, the life that he lives in the middle of the story. For the sake of the morning and to set the stage for the rest of the series, I think you see five things about the anatomy of a dream. Four of them I heard a pastor, John Mark Comer, say one time, and I just couldn't shake it, and it actually got me reinterested in this story. So I want to give him credit for that, but then I want to tag one more on at the end. I want to give you five things uh, that you can expect When the dream that you have comes to pass, it will almost certainly be, one, different, two, harder, three, longer, four, better, and five, tested along the way. Different, harder, longer, better, and tested along the way. Let me just say a quick word about all of those. First, different. You notice that? You can think about Joseph's dream at the very beginning like an acorn compared to the experience he has at the very end. It has all the raw material, but in a lot of ways, when you compare the end to the beginning, it doesn't look anything the same at all. It's different. Joseph was a shepherd, a farmer in the first dream. He's the prime minister of Egypt at the end of the story. He's young in his first dream. He's at least middle-aged by the time the story comes to pass. In fact, it's so different that when he begins living into it, the passage says he remembered it. Like, whoa, this is exactly like the dream I dreamed when I was 17, even though it's not really anything like that at all. It's different. That's important for those of us who dream dreams. In a couple of ways. One, for, for some of us, Even thinking about what our dream is can be paralyzing for us. Because we feel like in order to have a dream or to share a dream, we have to see the whole dream in its fullest sense. Everyone has a sense that we're here for a reason. You you may not be able to put a bunch of flesh on it. You may just have the seed of it. Part of this series is designed to encourage you to think and even begin talking about that. Even in its seed form, holding with an open hand, knowing that just like with an acorn, sometimes there's a planting and a releasing and a burying and a breaking and a transforming along the way as it becomes what was there all along. Josie Bazette says this about dreams, and I love it. She says, dreams often come a size too big so that we can grow into them. That's reason number one. Reason number two, 
that I think it's important to notice that dreams are different is so we can rest there. We'll say a lot more about that as we go throughout the series. When we begin to sense that the seeds of a dream are from God, we can both expect it to come to pass and expect it to transform along the way. God rarely gives his people a vision of the future in full 4K. He generally reveals just enough about the future to invite us to orient our hearts towards it and to trust him with the next right step in the right direction. Even if in the moment, the next right step doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's different first. Second, harder. You see that in Joseph's original dream? He sees the bowing and the feasting. He doesn't see the cistern or the slavery or the rejection of his family or the false accusations or the years of being forgotten in prison. It's harder than he dreamed it in the beginning. Tons of examples of this. Marriage is an easy, low-hanging fruit example, isn't it? A bunch of us are married. A bunch of us, that's still in our dreams, right? Some of us, not married, not in our dreams for a whole lot of different reasons. But hopefully you can relate to this. When we dream of marriage, think, we dream of all of the mountaintops and none of the valleys. We acknowledge the valleys, but only because we know they're part of the mountaintops. They exist philosophically, theoretically. They're not really part of the dream that we dream. And then we get married. At some point, you can start seeing the picture in reverse. The mountains can feel like they're really just descents into valleys and then slow, strenuous climbs back out of them, only to be able to enjoy the peaks just for a moment, but knowing you can't really stay there for very long. Which one is it, marriage? Peaks or valleys? Both. And neither. If marriage isn't a helpful example, careers can be the same way, can't they? We study, we get accepted, we get hired, we have dreams, what a career will look like, the responsibility and the influence, the paycheck, the contribution we'll make to the world in our dreams. But on the way towards the dream, it's harder in ways we never dreamed. In ways that seem like sometimes we're living the exact opposite of the dream that we dreamed. So important to see that in Joseph's story because this is the moment for a whole lot of us when we tend to give up. This is where we tend to tap out or opt out or burn out or quiet, quit, and rust out. Not just at the career or the marriage, but even more ultimately the hope that our lives can have any meaning at all, that the dream can ever come true from here. We'll see it in Joseph's story all along the way, but it's why it's so important to have a different compass setting than just the ending of your story. We'll miss who the dream giver is making us all along the way. Different, harder, and longer. Realize it's 22 years between the dreams Joseph dreams and the moment he even begins putting the pieces together. It's easy to skip over that when you're just pressing through the story. Joseph sat alone in prison, forgotten, even by the people that he'd helped for two whole years. I mean, I tend to start feeling sorry for myself when my prayers aren't answered in a couple of days. A couple of months, I'm pretty confident God's doing the Randy Jackson. Like, it's a no for me, dog. You see it in Joseph's story. Maybe it's true in yours. Sometimes it's better for our dreams to be deferred than immediately realized. It's easy to see in Joseph's story when we buzz through it in 10 minutes. Can you imagine Joseph who started the story as the prime minister of Egypt? Of course not. It would have destroyed him. It would have destroyed his family. He couldn't possibly see it at the time, but he wasn't ready for that then. He couldn't possibly see it at the time. He was being formed and shaped and tempered and developed and forged over time as someone who was prepared to live in his dreams. God will always mature us before he will trust us with the destiny he has for us. He will always mature us before he'll trust us with the destiny he has for us. 
That takes us to the fourth thing. Because they were different, harder, longer than he thought, they were able to be better than he dreamed. Not necessarily by human standards, but by the eternal standards that would be our human standards if we could see what God sees and know what God knows. We only ever see one scene of our story. God sees the whole picture. And remember, when Joseph has the dream, the dream's all about Joseph. And it was the biggest thing he could dream from there. He never dreamed of this at the end of the story. At the end of the dream, it's not about Joseph at all. Joseph plays a critical role in the story, but he's not the only star of the story, even the main star of the story, the only beneficiary of the dream that he dreamed. He becomes the agent through which God keeps his promise to God's people and prepares the way for Messiah all the way to you and me to where 4,000 years later, people sit down and look at this story, and in particular the original dream, and think, ooh, ooh, no, no, don't like that at all. But who follow the story all the way to the end, find ourselves worshiping because of what God did. What he did in Joseph and through Joseph especially when we realize there's a straight line from there to our ultimate hope in Jesus. Different, harder, longer, better, and finally tested. And I won't spend a lot of time there because this is where we're going in the series. But I mean it in two ways. First, tested from the human side. Joseph's going to be offered detours, distractions all along the way, the test of prosperity and poverty and integrity and relationships and endurance and legacy. Opportunities to chase a quicker, easier, simpler, lesser dream that looks more like the original dream and misses God's best for his life. The dream's also tested from the other direction. This dream is going to be heat tested and pressure tested and load tested and endurance tested in a way that shows all of us, even when the dream is different and harder and longer and better, that the dream giver can be trusted with our lives so that ultimately we'll choose to chase the dream giver more than even just the dreams he gives, especially when we find ourselves in the middle of the story. And that's where we're headed in the weeks ahead. This week, I just want to invite you to invest some time thinking about your dream. Bigger than the dream of a big house, nice cars, or even marriage or career or 2.5 kids or grandkids, maybe you'll have to think deeper Maybe you'll have to think back further to the acorn of a dream way back when. Do you have some sense of what it is? What it was? Why you're here? None of us believe that when our mother gave birth to us, God in heaven said, oh gosh, another one. Now I'm going to have to figure out what to do with them, you know? And yet so many of us live our life like that's the case. As if somehow God doesn't have a plan for our life. A purpose for us. Even if we're a long way away from it today. I wonder if you'd spend a little time this week scouring your story and asking him to show you even the teeny tiny seeds of that dream. And then maybe take the step of sharing it with somebody that you trust. A best friend, a spouse even if it's just in its seed form, maybe with your whole community group. And even if you can't see just the seeds, perhaps asking them if they see any clues that perhaps you've missed along the way. Here's what I think you'll discover. I think it can help you make some sense of the present. I think it can help you make some decisions about the future. And I think it can help you live towards your dreams, even from within a nightmare because you'll realize something about the presence of the author of your story, the kinds of stories that he writes, the kinds of endings that he promises. Even when they're so far in distant eternity, you can't see them from here. When they're different, they're harder, they're longer, better, and tested along the way. Would you bow with me? Lord, some of us are in a moment today a long way away from the dreams we dreamed. And sometimes it's because of the paths that we've taken. 
Sometimes it's because of the circumstances that found us, but we find ourselves in a moment like this wondering if that could be true of us. If you can still write anything in our story from here. And Lord, we're grateful for the story of Joseph that points us towards ultimate hope that ultimately comes in Jesus, who came to live the perfect story, to die a death he didn't deserve, and to give us hope and forgiveness and purpose, and power, and his presence in our life from here on out as he continues to write our story from wherever we find ourselves today. Or if there are those who have never put their trust in him, I pray that this would be the moment that they do that. And for those of us for whom it's been a long time since we walked with him, I pray that today would be the day that we take our next right step towards the author and perfecter of our faith. And it's in his name we ask that. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.